Good morning, everyone. So today I've been asked to share a view of African Bank's journey on microservices. I know yesterday Liam said that this was not a journey, but for us it absolutely has been. Um, my name is Clinton Fung. I look after technology innovation at African Bank. And we have implemented microservices. But before I get into all of that, I'd like to give a little bit of a view and a little bit of context about South Africa and about African Bank. We're a small bank much smaller than the typical bank that is a retail bank in the US. And the reason we're so small is that the market is extremely competitive in South Africa. We have only a population of about 55 million. Unemployment is very high, 29%. The South African Labor Development Research Unit in 2019 estimated that the monthly median income within South Africa is only $215. If I look at uh, recent stats within Seattle, we expect that to be between six and $10,000. Also, 99% of the country earns less than $2,180 per month. That should give you a sense of the level of inequality that we work with and uh, the size of the market versus those that are, are in the affluent area. In terms of inflation, we have 4%, double what you have in the US. And our average mortgage APRs are in the 10% range, more than double. The market is also dominated by five much, much bigger players. And we have new entrants coming into the market all of the time, all with very digital offerings, very compelling product offers, offerings. And we want to play in that space. So why do we want to play in that space? Well, you can see that from an inequality perspective, we found that uh, there's definitely a niche. There's definitely a need for this. Um, we have a, one of our slogans is we are you. It's something that you'll see um, sort of that we live all of the time. Our product marketing, we use our own, cust our own employees for all of our, our marketing. We don't sort of bring in additional models and things like that. And we see our purpose as advancing lives. So in order to advance lives, we've identified three pillars. Those three pillars are to create an innovative culture, one that is both diverse and inclusive. We want to be customer-centric, which for us means that we will work with the customer, start working backwards from their problems, and engineer very innovative solutions. And we want to use data. We want to use it smartly so that we make sure we're always delivering maximum value for our customers. It's very important because, as I mentioned, our customers are not affluent. We need to be able to provide them with innovative products at the right price point. You'll also see that our values are very geared towards this purpose. We value things like transparency and sustainability. It wouldn't make sense for us to offer products to our customers only to leave them in the lurch if something should go wrong with African Bank. So we are here and we are strong, and this is a, a broad view of our strategy. Now, you might wonder, if African Bank is playing in such a competitive market, and we are one of the small players, and it is vastly more difficult than normal to break into such a market, how could we possibly do this? So here's a quick recipe for how we see advancing lives in a competitive market working out. It's a combination of things, some things that we need to be able to get and some things we need to be able to do. So we want to start off with compelling products and services. We have an innovative community shared banking product that we have created. This is something that has a real need. It's very unique to the South African context where Someone that works in a city may be able to send money and share a bank account with family that lives in a rural area. We also need to be able to have competitive pricing. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Our customers don't want to pay for things that, we don't, that they don't need. So they don't want to pay for a private banker if they don't need that. If they, all they need is to be able to transact, get access to their money, be able to pay their bills, get access to credit that they wouldn't normally be able to get. We don't want to price for things they don't need. We also want to have a great customer experience. In Gus's previous keynotes, he mentioned that friction and customer experience is everything. So creating a no or low friction experience is super important for us. We've recently started on an omni-channel journey, and that journey is about creating 
or removing all the obstacles from customers. If customers have provided documentation before, we won't ask them about for it again unless we absolutely need to. We also offer customers the ability to work across different channels. So if a customer decides they'd like to speak to us, they can do that on the phone. They can come into our branches. They can use an app. They can use the web. In Africa, and specifically also in South Africa, we still have USSD as a very, very large channel, so they have the option of doing that. And all of these things work together in our omni-channel platform, and uh, a customer is able to transition between channels. We also need to service-enable our core operations. So this is something that pretty much means that we have legacy services that we need to somehow API enable, and we need to be able to share that across the organization so that we can collaborate. We need to entrench agility into the business. So for us, that doesn't necessarily mean big A agile. It means we need to actually get agility. So we don't necessarily do agile practices for the sake of doing agile practices. We do things that make sense. And lastly, we definitely agree that we can't do everything. As a small organization, we have to leverage partnerships, whether it be fintechs or other organizations that are able to help. That way, it allows us to focus on our core. Uh, and of course, we have to do this for pretty much zero money, and we need to do it as soon as possible. And we need to keep our staff happy while doing all of that so they can't work all around the clock. You'll see that a lot of these items are things that are embodied in the microservices, let's call it uh, ethos. And it's a completely different paradigm. So I won't go into the details because there, it would be too much of a religious discussion. But for us, when we talk about microservices, we're really talking about it from a non-technology perspective. And the, for the implementation of that, I would really encourage you to join for my colleague Fintan Wilson's uh, talk a little bit later. We'll go into details about how we actually did that. But during our journey, we came across a number of things. So we can go. Uh, thanks. Can we go one back? Thanks. These are not exhaustive, but they are the key points that I think that we could talk through uh, from our, our journey. For starters, we found that we could get better agility. Because we had deployed microservices, we could make changes in one area without affecting other areas. We could also make those changes much faster because we didn't have to kick off a complete huge testing cycle whenever we want to make small changes. When we talk about enterprise-enabled services, we were able to share services from areas of the business that were never able to access it before, between sales and collections, between customer service and, and our back offices. And we got better reliability through the ability to spin up multiple replicas. So if a replica sh should go down, we definitely understand that services will go down. But having multiple replicas, we were able to shield that from a customer. So the customer never notices that the system may have experienced a problem. But of course, with any mi microservices implementation, we have many, many moving parts, far more than we ever had before. So we had increased complexity. In order to address that, we had to implement a more mature CI-CD pipeline. That still runs today. It has the ability to do everything that you might expect from a CI-CD pipeline. Culture shock was probably the biggest thing for us. We come from an organization that historically has worked with, let's call them distributed monoliths. And everyone is used to having control over areas that they normally wouldn't have had control over in a microservices world. So for us, within our organization, there was a lot of hand-holding that had to take place, where teams had to get used to the fact that if they broke it, they owned it, and they had to fix it. And probably the biggest thing for us is that because microservices is such an overtraded term, there wasn't any standard out there that we could apply. African Bank has, it works in the, in the South African market, and in the South African market, we have a very strong regulatory system for financial services. Our central bank governor, Lesesha Khanyahu, was the 2018 central bank governor of the year. We obviously then needed something that we could use that would be a good starting point for us. And for us, that turned out to be the microservices reference architecture. It's something that provided us a good start. It wasn't complete, but we were able to work with Nginx as engineers to understand where those gaps were and solve those problems. So going forward, we have implemented microservices. What are we doing next? Well, 
I mentioned partnerships. Partnerships is a key thing for us. And partnerships really means that we need to find ways to offer our services to uh, our partners in a way that is secure, in a way that makes sense for them, that's easy. And so this is what we anticipate for our API management journey. We want to partner more with fintechs. Fintechs today want to use the technologies they want to use. They don't want to use what, we want to, or what we're already using. We need to find ways that we can choose the right fintechs with the right products and offer those in our existing channels. And we want to increase reuse. From a reuse perspective, we're not necessarily even talking about reusing our functionality. We want to reuse what's out there. So we want to embrace open API and open banking as a way for us to create an API marketplace that can make banking accessible to everyone. And we can allow fintechs and other organizations to help with that last mile delivery of financial services. And any talk would not be complete without mentioning security. Obviously, when you are opening up your organization to other organizations, you have to worry about things like security, ACLs, what are people allowed to do, are people, uh, who are, you, need, you need to be able to authenticate and provide authorization. And as I mentioned before, we have huge compliance concerns that we would need to deal with. In a microservices world as well, we would need to worry about things like API sprawl. So if teams are truly autonomous, then we need to worry about the fact that team A wants to run their API in one way, and team B wants to run their API in another way, and those are contradictory. So we need certain standards. And the lifecycle management of these APIs becomes even more important, because now it's not just African Bank that's dependent on these APIs. Our partners would be too. So all of these things are are part of our roadmap. We are very, very excited about what Nginx is planning from an API management perspective. It's something that we've been looking into actively for quite some time right now, and uh, I think we're pretty close to, to actively starting on that journey and actively starting to build things. And I hope it goes as well as our microservices journey has gone with the reference architecture. So just in closing, I'd like to start with, I'd just like to leave you with a few words, a couple of, a couple of things that may be helpful for if you're just kicking off this journey or if you're still on this journey right now. By far, the most important thing is to actually just start. Don't stand back and try and find the absolute perfect scenario because it's not out there. There's no off-the-shelf solution. Start with something simple. We started with the microservices reference architecture. We selected the fabric model. And then we worked with engineers to be able to customize it to our scenario. Make it practical. It allows you to deliver value sooner, to get buy-in from people that might be, might be detractors. But it also allows you to fail early. Super important to be able to figure out what's not working for you early on so that you can correct it. If you don't know where you're going, make sure you figure that out early. Otherwise, your architecture will end up being something that diverges, and it will be much difficult to align everyone later on in your organization once you figure out what that end goal is. And be courageous. Be ready to continuously reevaluate what it is that you're doing. No one has all of the answers. We still don't have all of the answers. I don't think Nginx has all of the answers. But know that once you figure out that something might not working, you need to be courageous enough to look, do some introspection, and, and move on from there. So that's the end of the talk, but I would really recommend that you, you attend my colleague Fintan Wilson's talk a little bit later on. He's going to go into a lot more detail about exactly how we implemented microservices, hands-on demo, and I'm also hoping to put a little bit of additional pressure on him now because he put a lot of pressure on me. And Gus, just one last thing. It just uh, I didn't have a fake news uh, slide this time, but, but I think my, mine will be real news about how the Springboks will beat the Wallabies. But thank you very much, everyone, for your time. Uh,